And uh, I just, I'm excited today in what God's doing and how He's looking. And like I would said this morning, uh, I had some phone calls uh, taking place. And uh, I told the, uh, the guy, he said, Brother Greg, why didn't you tell me? I said, you told me you was coming to church. Huh? Why in the world would you want to go anywhere else but church? I don't understand. That's me. I love to go to church. I love to see what God's doing and what He's going to do. And then I told him, I said, well, I said, I didn't know if Brother Stan was going to take the camera with him today or not. And, you know, and I, I really would like to have this message recorded this morning and, and videotaped and everything and come out. Brother Stan, he left it here. The, the other brothers, they were tied up and doing things that they needed to do this morning, and I didn't have no problem with that. They all had something they needed to do. And so I told this young man, I said, this is one thing for sure. God will have the sons of God there that he wants to hear this message this morning. I said, whether it's videotaped and being able to go out or not, God's going to put the children of God in there that this is directly for this morning, and I sure am glad to see you come out and partake in it this morning. There's an old song that goes by, uh, and, and, I, and I don't know anything but the old chorus to it, and, and I've heard it for years. And it, it goes, uh, God put a rainbow in the sky. God put a rainbow in the sky, and when it looked like the sun wouldn't shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the sky. Do you believe that? God put a rainbow in the sky. God put a rainbow in the sky, and when it looked like the sun wouldn't shine anymore, my God. He put a rainbow in the sky. As I began to turn on the news this morning, and the first thing that it had to set out was 10.4% of the uh, uh, people in Georgia are without a job. The highest growing number facing it has ever been in this, in this day and time that we live in. 10.4% of people in the state of Georgia are without work today. But you want to know something? The Bible said that God has never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. I want you to know God put a rainbow in the sky for his people today. For this time, for this hour that we live in. And I began to think upon this. I had a dream this week, and, and a lot of people call it visions and, and whatever. The Bible said, old men shall dream dreams. And it seems like that's what I feel like most time, bro, Mark, an old man that I dream dreams. And I'd been able to share this with it. And, 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 and there were several men that was with me, and, and I could only name one, but I'm not going to bring his name out. But there were several men with me, and, and I dreamed that I'd went down to, a, to like an archaeologist cave uh, that I knew that there was a, a hidden treasure in, okay? A monetary valued hidden treasure, and I went down there, and me and this other brother, and we was leading the men down there to go with us. It wasn't that we wanted it all for ourselves. We wasn't in a greedy spirit of that, of that sense. It was just looking like that was the way that we needed to go. And we went down there and we began to break through the cave, the entrance, to get on the inside. And sure enough, when we busted through the entrance of the cave, there lay the monetary values of the world sitting right before us in that. And the only thing that we had to do was two things. And the first thing in the dream was is to what? Get it up. And we all began to, to go into that, not paying attention to the second part of the equation. And the second part of the equation was that there was a curse upon the treasure that was hidden inside of this cave. Inside of everything it looked like that we needed, it was right inside of there, but there was a curse that also went along with it. And we couldn't help but to go in and do what naturally comes natural to a man, is to go after where the gold is and where the money is and the monetary values and the things that you want in life and the things that you perceive that is godly and that would supply all of your needs. 
But Jesus said this. He said, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. Not according to the world and not according to what man or mammon has put up, but according to what God has stored up into the storehouse of God that He said He would turn loose, that it would overflow your cup and run over, and you would not be able to contain the blessings that He had if you do it in the right way. But when you go about the wrong way, there is also a curse that is put upon the land. And when you go upon this thing, it will follow you all the days of your life. And I began to, me and the brethren, we began to get up the the gold. And it was like an old movie or something that you might have saw. There was a a, a Pharaoh or an Egyptian or or some kind of demon that was in there, or a mummy type figure, that when we partook of what was inside this cave, it began to follow us throughout the dream. We got it, we put it in the vehicles, and we drove off. And it was persistent that it was coming after us. Everywhere we went, that curse followed us. Everywhere that we partook of the curse of that mammon, that thing that was out there that we was trying to, to, the Bible said you can't serve two gods. You can't serve God and mammon. You're going to have to choose one and let the other go. You're going to have to depend on one and let the other go. One way or the other. Now, that choice is yours this morning. You can either depend on God or you can depend on what the world wants to give you. Okay? And I want you to know something. This curse began to follow us everywhere we went. And me and the other brother, we separated parts. He went one way with his, I went one way with mine. And, and, and you know, the people that was with me, they, they stayed with me. And the people that wanted to go with him went with him. I didn't have no problem with that and still wouldn't have no problem with it today. We were still both having our own issues that we had to deal with this situation that was at hand. But something began to prick my heart. And I realized that the only way to get rid of the curse was to go and put mammon back inside of the cave, seal it up, and wash my hands clean of it, and walk away and trust in God. And thank God that according to my dream, I went back with the brethren that was following me, put the curse back into the cave, sealed it up, and walked away from it, and refused to have part in what the world seems to give. Now I want to tell you something. If you want to go by the way of the world this morning, you can be part of the 10.4% in the state of Georgia that is starving slapped to death, or you can go on to the highway of heaven where the glory of God is, where all the manifestation of God is, where all the food is, where all the wealth is, where all the love is, where all of God is, and be blessed by Him if you want to go by the right way of doing things this morning. Amen. Amen. The choice is yours today. I was late getting to church this morning, and how many in here know that I'm always early, that I can't stand being late? Huh? I go and I work with several men, and if they start 30 seconds past the time that they said they would start, it hurts my spirit. I can't help it. I want to be on time for God. I want to be doing something for God. I want to be about the Father's business. Amen? And that's the way that we all should be. But this morning, I was late coming to church because I could not make up my mind like a, like a woman this morning. We accuse our, our ladies that when we want to take them out to eat, they got to go change 10 or 15 outfits and straighten their hair up and do all this kind of thing. How many is guilty of that this morning, you men? I always accuse her sister Denise raised her hand of even being late doing it, you know. But we accuse the lady folks of the one that's hindering us and slowing us down from getting to the destination that we want to get to this morning. I want you to know something that is very, uh, uh, oh God, I wish I was smart enough to know the right words to say. That is very respectful in the, in the sense this morning that I'm preaching to you today that as far as mankind is concerned, you are the woman part of God today. You are supposed to be the bride of God today. You are supposed to take the feminine side as God begins to impregnate you with the Word of God and to the standard 
standard of life that you're supposed to live or you're supposed to represent the bride of the almighty God today and a lot of times we're hindering God from getting to the destination of where he wants to go to today it's not nobody's fault but our own because we're not more blessed of God than what we are today we represent that woman's flesh this morning that would hinder God from already doing some things. I was listening to a tape yesterday on Brother George Pike, and I was beginning to really get into what was being said. And the brother that was playing the tape, he, he played it a while, and he talked a while. And he, I was like, man, leave the thing alone and let me hear what God is trying to translate the mind to. And Brother George began to say this, from the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God was slain before Adam ever come into the world. Sin had already been forgiven before Noah come into the world. Sin had already been forgiven. But the blood had already been shed because from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was crucified for you and me that we could go on and become the translated mind of God. And I began to think about that being the translated mind of God. How dare we walk around into the mammon side of the world today always concerned about where our bread's going to come from or where we're going to be doing this or where we're going to be doing that. And God began to speak to me after this dream. Greg, if you're going to ever do anything with God, you're going to learn to trust in what I'm doing and not what you're doing. I began to... Think about jobs. And I've always been a creative mind. I've always been that. From the time that I was a child and my dad began to teach me to work, I was a creative mind trying to figure out one thing, how to do that work a little bit easier. But I was a creator of jobs. I would look around and see what it would benefit and how to start jobs. And I have always been one to start a job and give it to another brother trying to bless them and show them that they was a way out that you could overcome and that you could be blessed more than any natural man on the face of the earth but I've never been allowed to keep those kind of jobs, even to this day. I can start, man, those things goes on my mind. It snaps and it goes like this and I can get it started, but I have to give it to somebody else. Why? Because my job is not for mammon. My job is to work for the kingdom of God. And the Lord let me know real quick this week, if I would put this church first, if I would begin to lift up the people in this church, if I would begin to push the issue of His work throughout the land, of the, of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the gospel of Sardis Church, I don't you to know something. The gospel of Sardis Church will send you straight to hell and will not deliver you. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will make all things new. Amen. There's a difference in man's doctrine and God's doctrine. The Bible said this. He said, your ways are so far from my ways. What you think was right is so far from the way that I think is right. People chasing a dollar bill out here today. I want you to know, you can't live in this monetary system that we live in without the dollar bill. But you don't have to give God up to have it. You hear me? You don't have to chase the world and let the world come your God. You can become God and let the world see God through you. And God will bless you above every natural thing that's in the face of this earth. Chapter 9 of the book of Genesis. If we're going to have a beginning, we need to go to the beginning, don't we? We need to see what in the world God is doing this morning. We need to find out what is taking place in the lives that we're living. How should we be acting? What is a blessing of God? What is a cursing of God? See, what we don't understand, the very thing that we might believe that is a blessing of God could be the worst curse that you've ever had put upon you in the face of this world. Huh? You understand that? Oh, Brother Greg, I got this job. Oh, and this job 
It's so great. I want you to know something. I've got a young man out of church this morning because he decided chasing a dollar bill was more important than being in the house of God. If he thinks, and I will talk to him personally, if he thinks that he can survive in this world, he's already been in more trouble than any man I know, and if he thinks that he can survive chasing a dollar bill on a day that God has separated to go and worship mammon over God, you're going to fall every time. Just about the time that you think you're getting blessed and God is really blessing you, you'll turn that blessing into a cursing. It has nothing to do with God except that you refuse to line up to what God is telling you to do. You hear me this morning? Brother Mark, one of the greatest real estate men i ever known. He can do things right or he can do things wrong. He could take what he thinks is right and turn it around and he wouldn't be able to sing a song for God. He wouldn't be able to teach a lesson to God. He couldn't find an anointing of God and the whole time he'd be thinking that he was doing God's will if he allowed the things of the world to take place of the things of God. Do you understand that? Is that right? You understand this morning? If I go out there in this world and I want to be a minister for God and I have this quality in me to do this thing and I begin to chase the world and the cursings of the world, what I might think all of a sudden is a blessing of God a turning to a curse and you will not find yourself, it will become that the house of God is so distant to you that you cannot find peace and harmony in your life in the house of God or anywhere else. The worst thing that you can do is go to hell this morning and have the Spirit of God withdrawn from you. You know what that's what hell is? Do you not understand that this morning? Hell is simply this right here. The Spirit of God being withdrawn from you. That is what hell is. You want to talk about torment? You want to talk about weeping? You want to talk about wailing and gnashing of teeth? When you, the Spirit of God is withdrawn from you and you can't find no peace in the world and they're persecuting you, they're talking about you, but you have separated yourself from God and you can't find love from God and you can't find love from men, that is a hell that you're going to walk through. When you begin to put everything else in front of God, cursings will come. When you put God first, you can't help but to be blessed. When you begin to look at the world in a whole situation, when you begin to look and partake in everything that's going on, when you begin to see that God is moving, that He is a centripetal force, and He's a moving and He's a drawing, and all these things are taking place, and the only thing that you're on a job, and you might be hammering a nail, you might be using a paintbrush, you might be driving a truck, you might be washing a dish, whatever's going on in your life, when you begin to look and see that God is in motion, and He is moving. The rest of the world doesn't bother you. You could go through life happy and never let nobody come by you and blow a horn and get mad. Huh? Look at me this morning. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. I'm trying to show you that you can get to heaven or you can stay in hell. It's your choice today. It ain't got nothing to do with you. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's all got to do with the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's benefiting out there. This is the thing. Verse 8 of chapter 9. 9 is representation of the gift. It's what that number means, the gifts. 8 is a new beginning. How many of you need a new beginning this morning? Huh? How many is trusted in the jobs in the state of Georgia and they failed? Bro Richard, be all right to use you? That's good. <laughs> Brother Richard was working 40 plus hours a week, most of the time 50 plus. Brother Richard's job began to dwindle down. I talked to him just a few minutes ago. He's gone to 32 hours a week. You understand that? From 50 something hours a week to 32 hours a week, they are being blessed every time that they turn around. There's money in the bank, their bills are paid. And if you want to know the truth, they've already blessed the church with more money this in the last couple of weeks than most people could even think about even having a paycheck to come in to buy new equipment with that the word and the gospel could go out across the land and let people know that even at 32 hours a week, that God will let your cup run over. Amen. 
32 hours a week gives you more time to rest. It gives more time to be productive. It gives you more time with your family. It gives you more time doing things that you want to do. And you still get more money than what the world could even spend. I want you to know that's a blessing of God raising a great granddaughter. Not a son, not a daughter, not a granddaughter, but a great granddaughter. They're raising, starting all over again. And money's in the bank, buying diapers. Huh? You understand that? Money's in the bank. I'm so ashamed of my bank account, I don't even look at a checkbook. <laughs> there ain't nothing in it. <laughs> huh? Why? Because I'm just now figuring out Quit chasing the monetary value and go to chasing God. Brother G.W. Thomas preached that message Tuesday night a few weeks ago. Be a God chaser. Be a God chaser. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him saying, This morning I told you, this message would go out not just for me, but it would go out to the sons of God this morning. If you get a hold of this message that I'm trying to in my... I'm the world's worst in eloquent speech. I want you to know that. I understand that. I, I'm a country boy. I graduated high school. I could have went on to college, but when it comes to eloquent speech, I'm the poorest in the nation. I want you to know that I am worse than George Bush Jr. When it comes to speaking, ain't is just the way it goes for me. You understand? I just use the word ain't. And that's just good English as far as I'm concerned. But I want you to know this. If you can hear what God is trying to say this morning and overlook my speech that I have, you're a son of God and you can perceive what God is about to do in the land of the United States of America that we're going to be blessed above every nation that has ever been. We already are. We're going to continue to be blessed the sons of God are. Now, America is finished as a nation is concerned without God. If they turn their hearts back to God, it's a change. But if they don't, they've been sold down the toilet and they've been flushed. And that's just the way it is. But the sons of God that are in America are still going to be fruitful and they're still going to multiply and they're still going to replenish this earth. How can you say that, Brother Greg? Because I believe every single word that was ever written in the King James Version Bible. I believe everything that God inspired every man of old to write. I believe if He said you are healed by the blood of the Lamb, if you're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimonies, if you're healed by the stripes that was put upon His back, if you have, if He's got more blessings than you can contain, I believe every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, every line, dot, and tittle of it, I believe that every dot's going to be crossed. Every dot's going to be dotted. Every, every eye's going to be dotted. And everything's going to be just right. And God spake unto Noah. God speaking unto Noah today, y'all. Noah was the Melchizedek priest that walked upon the face of the earth at this time. He was the highest order of God that was known to man in this day, in this hour, in this time. I want you to know there is Melchizedek priest still walking on the face of the earth this morning. Jesus Christ said, I come in the like manner or in the order of Melchizedek. I want you to know the ones that are coming in the order of Jesus Christ today are still coming and walking in the order of Melchizedek today. And it is just like this. Thus saith God, and it shall come to pass. That's the way it was. That's the way it is. And that's the way it will be. That's the way that Jesus chose it to happen. Noah was the Melchizedek man walking in the flesh realm at that time. He was God manifested in the flesh of that day. And His sons with Him. I want you to know God hasn't just spoken to me today, but He's spoken to the sons of God. And I behold, I establish... My covenant with you and with your seed after you. Aren't you glad this morning? 
that he said that he would save not only you, but your entire household. If you walk up right before me, if you'll stand up right before me, if you'll be bold before me, I will save your entire household. I'll go to the very ends of the earth. I want you to know, Jesus said this, Father, them that you gave me, them that you put in the palm of my hand, from the foundation of the world to the ending of the world, not one of them's ever been lost. And if you put in God's hands, and you're saved today. If you're not, you better be finding you an altar and bagging that you can become an adopted son of God. If there's something pricking your heart, you don't have to wait till a message is over with in this church. You can find God. You can run to the altar. You can go to streaming out and crying out to God. I want you to know, if you're desperate today, you will find what's going on. Listen, if a man is hungry and his children are starving, he would get out and, and look for every can on the side of the road until his family was fed. I told a man this week, he was talking about he's always paid his child support. And I said, and you know if you hadn't, I'd count you worse than a dog. I'd count you worse than an infidel. A man that won't look after his family, he ought, not, he ought to be drowned and put into the ground or burn his flesh up. I believe he ought to be cremated. I don't even think the ground's good enough for him if he won't look after his children. That's how serious God is. Do you think that God would turn his back on you? If he said that a man won't look after his family, he's worse than an infidel. If you don't think that, that God will look after, if he would say that, you don't you think God will look after you? Why in the world do you think that there's any way that a curse could come upon you unless you're just being rebellious and you're trying to act like a bastard instead of a son of God? If you're a son of God, God is going to look after you. He may chastise you, but he's going to bless you. And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you. That means all of your cattle. That means all of your birds. That means all of your goats, all of your sheep, everything that is with you. That means the friends. That, the Bible said this at one time. If a stranger wants to build a house right next to your land because God allows it to rain on yours and the Bible said it'll rain on the just and the unjust just alike. If they want to live beside of you because of the blessings of God, you ought not get mad. You ought to be excited for them. You ought, to be, you ought to be excited to know that God is being revealed through you. Huh? You ought not get upset when somebody else is getting blessed. I have a problem with greed. I have a problem with gimme, 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 gimme. I have a problem with people like that. I do, and I deal with it all the time. Worried about somebody else is going to Make a little bit of money, and they're not going to make as much. Do you know what the Bible said? The Bible says, if you've got an employer, you're to work to make him rich. If you ain't working to make him rich, if you're just drawing a paycheck, you and him both is in trouble. More you than him, because you won't be able to survive off of what you're making. But if you're out there going the extra mile, to make sure that he's blessed, God is not going to let you suffer. He's going to put it upon you abundantly. <laughs> And I will establish my covenant. Let's see, let me go back to verse 10. This is very important. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. To be blessed of God, you must have been in the covenant of God. That's the number one thing. You cannot be blessed of God without finding out the fullness of the Godhead. You cannot be blessed of God without being part of the family of God. You cannot be blessed of God unless you have entered into the ark of safety. You understand that this morning. That, in other words, you need to get saved. You need to repent. You need to get into the ark where the floods is coming against you. The only thing it's going to do is raise the ark up. Everybody can come against you, and it's just going to raise you that much higher. You can get into the ark there. They cannot hurt you. They cannot harm you. They can beat and pound on your door all day long. But God has shut the entrance for the enemy to get near you, and they cannot destroy you. My daddy told me growing up, he said, Boy, be careful when you go swimming with other people. 
because if they don't know how to swim, or maybe if they do know how to swim just a little bit, and you get out into deep water and something happens, and they get a hold of fear, they will climb you and drown you if you're not careful. My daddy taught me that at a very young age. It might have been right after he threw me in the water and said, swim or drown. That really happened at the McKinney Fish Pond in South Georgia. And thank God this day that my brother dove in the water and picked me back up because I swam just like a rock all the way to the bottom. I was young and dumb, and I still think that I am today. But uh, he taught me that when I did learn how to swim. He taught me, he said, you be careful of other people because they'll climb you like a tree. And it doesn't matter to them just as long as they're all right. And that's a very good thing to learn this morning, and I'm learning it the hard way. People have gotten me out in the deep water when they thought they could swim, and they began to climb me and push me under the water. And it didn't matter just as long as they were on top of the world. It didn't matter if I was dying, if I was hurting, if my family was suffering. It hasn't mattered not one ounce to them. Just as long as I kept them at the top and they could breathe, this old boy could die as far as they was concerned. My daddy taught me a big lesson. And boys, I'm beginning to preach to you. I'm beginning to understand some things to myself this morning. Do not allow people to push you down and keep you down and overcome by you being under the bottom. God wants you to be at the top breathing everything that He's got. Amen. He doesn't want you to be on the bottom. He doesn't want nobody getting to the top by pushing you to the bottom. A friend will take you by the hand and y'all go together. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say this. Do you know how you get out in deep water? And you go out and you're trying to save somebody's life and they attack you and they're pushing you under and they're fighting to climb you like a tree, do you know the onlyest way to get a hold of the situation? And knock them out. That's the exact truth. The onlyest way that you can save somebody out to keep them from fighting you is to knock them out. Grab them by the nap of the hair or their neck and get it, and then swim into land together and then worry about reviving them once you get them to the shore. Because if you fight with them while you're out in deep water, you're both going to drown. Because just as soon as they drown you, <laughs> they ain't got no hope. And that's what's going on in the state of America today. They put their trust in mammon. They put their trust in the government. They put their trust in these uh, false leaders out there. They put their trust into the ungodly sinners of the world. They've turned their heads and their minds against God. They don't have a translated being about them. And they've gone by the way of the grave. And they're sucking you down just by every time that you listen to what they got to say about how they're going to change. They can't change America. There's not a creative being about them. They don't have a creative mind. Only the children and the elect of God can create. They sit up there and they destroy. And that's what happened to the great Roman Empire. They did not have anything about them to create. And they suck the life out of every nation that they ever overcome. And when they suck the life out of every nation they overcome, they fail. And the Bible said, fall was the great thereof. And old Mystery Babylon, I want you to know today, without God, you're going to fall. You're going down, and you're going down fast. You're going to sink greater and faster than the city of Atlantis ever dreamed about doing. You're going down because you're Mystery Babylon. You run up there and you babble everything, but you will not yield unto the mind of God. You will not yield unto the things that's going to change from an incorrupt world and put to, uh, to a, from a corrupt world to an incorrupt state. You won't change. You're still going by the way of the world and by the way of the devil and by the way of that mentality mind, and there's no sense in doing nothing but falling. That's all you'll know how to do. Only a creative mind will create themselves to come out and be in God. <laughs> But you gotta, when you go out of the ark, then you can be covered. But you've got to be in the ark first to understand the covenant. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by waters of a flood. People can come against you. They can find out what waters means, people. They can come against you. They can flood against you. They can come and try to devour everything about you. But you will not be cut off anymore from God. 
They cannot rob you anymore because you're going to see what's taking place and you're going to guard upon it. You're going to find out everything that God is doing and what He's doing and you're going to live for God and work for God and, and, and move for God. And when God moves, you're going to know it. I'm not going to have to tell you. You're a creative mind. You'll know what God's doing. I don't have to tell you when you commit sin, do I? Hmm. It's written upon your heart. God knew that they was going to do away with the law. God knew that they was going to take it out of the schools. God knew they was going to take it out of the courthouses. God knew that they was going to take it out from anything. They're going to take it out of the churches. They're going to do this. God so what did he do? He said, well, I'll fix it. I'll write it upon the tables of your heart. And if you begin to meditate upon these things, you cannot sin against God. It's when that you don't meditate upon God is when you get in trouble. Is that not right? How many of you have been meditating upon God and keeping your mind on God and you're, and you're starving slapped to death? Won't work. God said He never saw the righteous forsaken nor His seed bagging bread. Oh, you may not be thinking that you're a millionaire, but you're more than a millionaire. Huh? What is better, to be a millionaire and then when it runs out it's gone, or to have favor with God that it's always there no matter what? Huh? What is better to have favor with God? I had a, had a man tell me one time, big, robust man. Some of you know him very well. He's come to this church several times, and, but he, don't, he, he lives in South Georgia. He said, Brother Greg, we was just two of us out in the middle of the woods working on a building out there, a youth camp, just me and him. He said, Brother Greg, I've never seen you when you wouldn't backslid. Boy, I've heard that about me here lately. <laughs> praise God. Praise God you've been backslid. No, praise God I'm still hearing it. He said, I've never known you when you wouldn't backslid. But when you stand up in the pulpit, you have favor with God. I said, I'll take it every time. I'll take it every time that if I can have favor with God over what man thinks about me, I'll take the favor of God every single time. Why? Because God will never fail you. He'll never leave you. He'll never let you starve. He'll never let you do without. He'll never turn His back on you when man will turn their back every time. I'll take favor with God all day long. Why? Because of this right here. When I pray to God, when you come up here and you say Sister Savannah has got problems and she needs prayer with Brother Greg, I'll take the favor of God that a healer. Because I believe thus saith God. I'll take it. And I'll believe on it. And I'll live on it. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. There's not going to be something that will come up and take the Word of God out of you anymore. There's not going to be something come up that's going to disturb you that much anymore. Oh, are you going to go through battles? Are you going to go through troubles? Is it going to hurt when you find out that somebody says that, that, that you're not really a good person? Yes, it hurts. Especially when they're supposed to be a brother or sister in Christ. It hurts. Oh, it does. But will it destroy your faith in God? Not one chance. Not one chance. You want to know why? I'm still going on with God. You see the baby up here this morning? I got a phone call this week. I didn't even call the daddy on this. I got a phone call this week. ICU, trouble, calcium, and uh, potassium. Cal potassium, a drop in potassium killed my brother. You understand that? His potassium dropped. We did not know it. He went into a massive heart attack. He's laying in the ground up here waiting on the day that we can become men and women of God and redeem him, and he walks up out of that thing. Potassium kills a lack of it. Or too much of it. The child didn't have no potassium in its body. The child didn't have no calcium in its body. It was in, in ICU and in dire need. They just happened to be a man of faith that was within two feet of me this week. And I reached over and I called his name out, Brother Michael Pike. He stays on his knees more than anybody I know. When I call on Him, I don't have no fear that He's got to get a hold of God because He's already in tune with God. 
And I reached out my hand. I said, Brother Michael, take your hat off. He immediately snatched his hat off. I didn't even say what the problem was. I began to grab his hand. We joined together and we began to pray. And the Bible said, any two or three, touching means agreeing, and anything, what? It shall come to pass. You hear me this morning? I want you to know the days of God is on hand. The days of playing's not no more. But God is moving in the land. Right here in the United States of America. I got a phone call the next day. Not only is the baby's calcium better from the moment that the prayer was made, not only was the potassium better, but it stepped down out of ICU. Give the Lord a hand clap. Brother Greg, why do you got this picture up here? This picture's not coming down until the baby comes home. You understand that? Until the baby comes home and it's in the arms of its mother, from that point on, the picture's not coming down. Because I believe it's coming down. I believe it's coming home. I believe that all them tubes and stuff, by the way, is out of the baby too. Why wouldn't you want to serve God, y'all? What's more important than life? Maybe you haven't had life, so you don't know what is so exciting about life. Maybe you haven't struggled. Maybe you haven't guessed for air. Maybe you haven't guessed for a breath. Maybe you haven't felt your heart giving away that you don't understand about life and how precious Life is. And the only way to have life is not to breathe the air, but it's to breathe God. The great Jehovah Jireh, our provider, the mighty Yahweh, Yahshua, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to have life is to be in Him. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will rem- remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Back at verse 15. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you. And every living creature of all flesh and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all the flesh. I was talking to a young man about, you know, how the King James Version, it'll use you and it'll also use ye. Y-E. And I began to talk to this, this elder man about this, these two words one time and and he talked to me, and it stuck with me ever since then. He said, when the Bible says Y-E, it's talking about everybody. But when it gets down to Y-O-U, it's talking directly to you. Directly to you. God said this, that He had a covenant this morning that He was going to put in there. And it was going to be a rainbow. And it was going to set out there. And I began to get up this morning with that song on my mind. It was on my mind yesterday and the day before. Like I said, after I had this dream about the monetary values of the world. And you know, I dress in colors. I don't dress a lot in black. Black is death. I don't like black. Black is a good color. (laughs) I mean, you know, seriously, it looks good. It really does. But what it represents is I have trouble with it. I do. I, I'm a man of types and shadows. And to stop some of the heat of the sun from getting on you and it'll put you into a shade or to put you into a darkness place. I want you to know something. America has been dark. 
We've had a cloud put upon us. Jobs are dissipating. Jobs are going around. Men's, men, men are beginning to go down. They're losing hope. They're, they're getting some, some uh, 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 depression put upon them. Oppression's being coming upon them. It looks like no matter what you try, that the world is fighting against you. It, it looks like that everything that you're trying to do for God, you're taking three steps back. It looks like that everything is going against somebody if you're trying to live for God. Is that not right? Talk to me, church. Admit it to yourselves if it's true or not. It looks like that, that America and the American people and the American true way of life has been under a cloud. It looks like that we've had it come in and it's trying to take over and it's trying to force us out of the state or the translated mind of God. But I want you to know something. According to the vision of George Washington, he said it once at this time come and the oppression come upon the people and the dark cloud come from...